Now, real life can be quite a sort of tricky place. And the whole point in physics is that we can try and model real life situations as simply as possible. And what, one way that we can do this is trying to look at all the forces perhaps on an object, the various bits of drag all over the different the wings, the kind of the thrust from the engine, uh, and whatever else it may be, maybe the lift from the wings. And what we want to do is try and simplify this as much as possible. And that's where free body diagrams come in. So here I have my microlights, and what I'd like to do is look at the forces in a bit more detail. Now, I can't really draw microlights that well, so I'm just gonna draw a dot, and that's going to represent the object. I'm then gonna try and make this as simple as possible. First of all, we've got the force acting downwards, which is the weight. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my ruler, this is important, uh, to draw the weight of the object in. Uh, I'm gonna put an arrow to show which way that force is acting. Now, provided this is in level flight, it's not getting higher or lower, uh, and it's not getting quicker or slower, we can say that all the forces kind of add up to zero. And if we have a, a weight force here, which I'm gonna label W, we also have some kind of force which is acting upwards to stop it falling out of the sky. And in that case, I'm gonna draw this on, and I'm gonna label it L. Uh, and this is for the lift. So we've got the weight acting down and the lift acting upwards. Now, again, there's gonna be a force kind of pushing it forward, uh, and that force there is gonna be equal to the, the thrust. So here we have the thrust. And provided it's going in level flight, it's not getting faster or slower, there must also be some kind of air resistance. And I'm gonna call that the drag force. I'm just gonna draw that on as well. So what we have over here is my free body diagram for this real life situation. I've got the thrust, the drag, the lift, and the weight. Now we can't see these, but by visualizing real world objects like this, it makes it a lot easier for any subsequent calculations. So here we have a free body diagram for maybe a boat which is just bobbing up and down in the water. Again, we've got the weight force acting down and we have the up thrust which is uh, stopping it sink in the water. And if it's just floating, the up thrust is gonna be equal to the weight. And finally, we have uh, maybe a free body diagram for something large like this digger here. Again, we've got a very large weight acting downwards, and this is counteracted by the normal contact force, which is effectively the force of the ground pushing back up on this rather large object here. So far, this has all been pretty straightforward. But what happens if we maybe have a block that we put onto a slope and then raise that slope through a certain angle? Well, there's gonna be a point at which uh, there's gonna be a certain limiting friction between this block and the slope and then the block's going to move down it. And what I'd like to look at is when you can maybe take a, a block, you move it up a slope and it's not quite slipping. How can we represent that? Well again, I'm just gonna use my dot to be my object, perhaps the blue box here. We've got uh, certain forces acting on it. Again, we have the weight always acting down. So here's my weight, W. What other forces act on it? Well, it's going to be a normal contact force and this is gonna be at 90 degrees to the surface. So if I put that in at an angle a bit like this. So this is my normal contact force. And finally, there must be another force that stops it sliding down. In this case, it's friction. Now in this case, the friction is gonna be acting up the slope because it's wanting to stop it moving down. So what we have here is my free body diagram for the forces acting on a block on the slope. So I've drawn this diagram one more time just to uh, really elaborate on it. Now again, there's an angle of 90 degrees between the normal and the frictional force. And if we think about how this relates to the whole slope, well, there's going to be an angle theta between the angle of the slope and maybe the horizontal. What's important is that if the object's in equilibrium, then there's no resultant force. And that means the component of weight that acts down the slope is equal to the size of the frictional force acting up it. And there's also gonna be a component of this weight, which is acting at 90 degrees to the slope, which is gonna be the same amount as the normal force. And if we know that that angle there is theta, then this angle here too is theta. And therefore we can work out uh, perhaps um, the component of uh, weight acting opposite to the normal and the component of weight acting opposite to the frictional force, uh, provided we know some more details. But this is really important, it's a very hard example. You need to understand what happens when you have some kind of block acting on a slope at a different angle.